So tonight I'm going to be sharing a little bit more, more about coaching skills and how they can help you on your Salesforce projects. Um, the reason I got involved in coaching um, and use it in Salesforce projects is I started um, a coaching business when I was 25. Um, and that was around 2005, 2006. I skilled up as an NLP coach and also did coaching qualifications at City University in the UK. And I launched a coaching business, which was coaching young entrepreneurs to set up businesses. And we also evolved into career coaching, inevitably um, helping people figure out what they wanted to do. And at, during that time, obviously, we, we were using coaching tools and techniques, but I also started using Salesforce for that company. And it, Salesforce helped me grow um, my organization at that time, which was called Striding Out and helped me grow from 100K in one year to 1.3 million in another year. Um, it really helped us measure our impact better. It helped me market our services better. Um, and it proved our value to funders in that we were able to scale up quite significantly and support over 10,000 young people during the time that I was running the organization. So that kind of really, um, you know, obviously I had a great belief in Salesforce and what it could do, but I really found my techie side and ended up training up in Salesforce admin, app builder, um, and the consultancy training course that they delivered at that time, which was a one week course. It was amazing and they don't do it now. And um, that started my Salesforce career. Now, when, um, why I switched to being a Salesforce consultant was that um, the government funded funding changed in the UK. So it was proving harder to deliver these services to young people for free. So I made that decision to switch and to sort of take that plunge to be a Salesforce consultant. And for me, it was quite an intuitive switch in that using business coaching, I'd very much been working with customers to, um, and those young, those entrepreneurs really to help them, yeah, ask a lot of questions and help them think through their strategy, their processes, their KPIs, um, you know, how they were going to manage a team and develop and motivate a team. And so all those skills were very transferable when you think about the role of a business analyst um, and what you do from that point of view. And then adding those technical skills onto it, which I was able to grasp and sort of easily get my head around, um, I, I sort of went into the consultancy role. And having now run a consultancy, we've got over 20 staff on the consultancy side. We exclusively work with nonprofits in the UK. Um, we've worked with over 300 nonprofits on 600 clients. And I truly believe the coaching skills and tools that I use now very much um, as well. So that's why I wanted to share some of the tools tonight, because I truly think there'll be a light bulb moment for some of you on some of those tools where you think okay yeah I get it I get where these can be really applicable and can help me with my Salesforce projects um, and this is very much from my, ex my experience of both running projects but also overseeing where the common things go wrong now and I train now other uh, Salesforce professionals, mums, etc., other people who would join our courses that are not mums in coaching skills and in consultancy skills. And it's because of super mums and the work we do upskilling people in the sector that I got the golden hoodie at World Tour last year, which was, um, yeah, absolutely amazing to be given that recognition and, and, and wonderful. But I think my mission is obviously to raise awareness of getting more mums into tech roles. Um, and anything that I can do to support that is is what I'm about really is kind of helping accelerate more people into the sector, but also to support women and equality and inclusion in tech at the moment. So if you're interested more about super mums, um, we very much get involved in helping um, recruit and hire talent into companies. We also look for people to be mentors and trainers um, for our organization and ambassadors. We have had people from the Netherlands join the courses. So we are technically in your country um, as well. The, the courses are virtual. So we've literally had people from nine countries all over the world join them. And we've had volunteers from even more countries. Um, and so it really is a global organization. It went accidentally global, <laughs> which is always a part of the plan, right? But um, yeah, we, we can support mums wherever they are to get involved. So tonight, what I'm going to focus on is I'll touch a little bit around what coaching and NLP is specifically, um, for th those of you that perhaps haven't heard that term before. And then I'll look 
look at three specific tools, one around emotional intelligence, one around the SWOT analysis, and one around NLP logical levels. And then I'll tell you about our free download where you can get eight free coaching tools that can help you with your, your projects going forward. I think the other thing to mention though around coaching is that all these tools can be used for your own personal context and professional development as well to help you feel stronger um, and can be applied, um, not necessarily just for the Salesforce projects you're working on. And I think ever since I've learned coaching, I've been able to draw on those tools for my own resilience and confidence and strength and perseverance through some difficult times as well, um, you know, and, and really draw on them. So don't feel that these tools have so many different purposes and values to you. Um, and so I hope that you, as I say, you take something away tonight that is useful. So just to put NLP in context and, and, and I mean coaching more broadly is about empowering people and the way that you can empower people is to really understand their mind, how it operates, how they think so you can communicate to them in a way that works for them. So, you know, you might have one way of communicating something which works for you, but ultimately if the person listening doesn't take in information in the same way, then it won't hit the button that you would hope it to so tonight and, and as a nlp more broadly i'm going to help share how some of these tools help you think differently help you think from different perspectives because that will be more applicable to perhaps how the wider society will think so nlp helps you with stress management it helps you improve feelings of empathy because you understand a little bit more about other people it helps you improve your communication style and techniques um, and that can also help resolve destructive patterns of behavior where, um, you know, things aren't quite working out the right way. And neuro-linguistic programming stands for certain, you know, works through sort of a series of process, really. Neuro is about, stands for the mind and how it operates. Linguistic is about how we receive information and how we use language um, and sort of take it in. So if you like, we will take in information in different ways and we'll do that through sight, smell, taste, hearing, touch. Most of us will have a primary sensory element as well some of us will be more visual than others some of us will have a stronger auditory sense and, and sort of rely on hearing more so we'll have different primary elements and um, I won't go too much into that tonight but I will draw on it in a couple of areas and so we take in information we make sense of it and then we it programmers as if we get them program to do different things from that so it's not you're not going into this game i'm going to use an nlp tool to program somebody but it's just understanding about how they make sense of the world and then what will encourage them to take action as a result of it so it's understanding more about how the mind works for different people so you can communicate in different ways um, that isn't reliant on your preference style that's it in a nutshell. Obviously, you can sort of do a bit more um, reading of this from these slide decks that will get shared. But what I want to do is bring it to life for you a little bit more in sharing how a couple of, of three tools tonight work. So it helps you kind of just make sense of it. So we'll start with emotional intelligence. So the success of any Salesforce project, I believe, is based on user engagement, user excitement and user adoption. And this is from design through to training, um, you want people to be engaged. So these NLP tools are really about deploying the best communication styles, the best facilitation process in order to get people engaged, excited and adoption. Um, and I always say, whenever I start a workshop, I say my success is based on you all smiling when I walk out the room at the end of this session. That's how I know I've achieved Salesforce success. So I set that precedent right at the very beginning, um, but that's ultimately what you want, right? You want people to be happier in the way they work and that you've left them with a great system. That's what success feels like and looks like for somebody. So when you start the project, you have that expectation. The reality though on the journey will be quite different because people will go through different emotional states depending on where they're sitting at the beginning. So some things to just bear in mind, um, and these are the emotional states that we teach in more detail in the program, but people might be in different situations. So if you've got a new Salesforce team or you're working with a new client and you've got a new project team, you're going to be going through an emotional journey when you um, do the setting up of the team, which is forming the team, 
getting into a pattern and a rhythm that works and inevitably you'll go through a storming and norming phase the storming obviously being where it's not quite working the way that you wanted to the point that you get to a performing stage so the first thing is to be aware of is if you're working in any new team environment you will find that you'll probably go on this emotional journey and other people will too so you need to be aware of that and i'll come on to motivational things of like how do you improve that situation but you need to know how to manage that you need to be one aware of it and then to well how do I cope with that situation the second emotional journey that you will find people go on and indeed yourself too is that learning life cycle where you start learning something new and then you have that massive dip like I did when I started learning my platform one this year I was like I'm never going to do this <laughs> to the point that then you start coming up the other side and you've got to persevere with that you know i'm not going to get it straight away like i've got to work through it but what's really important from your point of view as a salesforce professional is that you are delivering training to accommodate for different learning styles particularly from the visual kinesthetic the auditory the auditorium the auditorial digital um, elements as well because you've got to deliver training in a way that hits all of those different um types of learning style or else people might not get out of that dip so that's why this starts to come into its own and you start to think actually okay this is important the way that i deliver training has to hit different people's learning styles in order to get them through and i also encourage my team whenever they're working with a salesforce customer to tell the team the clients that you're about to train like you're going to go through this learning dip today that's okay it's normal you're going to be excited right now you're then going to probably hit a dip where you're kind of like a little bit feeling a little bit of despair like oh my gosh this is too much to take on like am i going to get my head around it and then you'll invest the time what you need to do is invest the time getting to use the system you know keep reading you know you're going to go up that dip and so if you acknowledge that to people up front they're like okay this is normal rather than sort of freaking out that they don't know it so it's a great thing to kind of, again, educate your customers around. The third is the Kubler-Ross grief cycle, um, which is more renowned for, you know, if you lose a lot, uh, have a loss of a loved one. But also this is very relevant if somebody is going to be um, pining the loss of their spreadsheet. For example, you know, they're petrified around Salesforce. They really love their spreadsheet and way of working and they may be going absolutely through this grief cycle. Um, similarly, you might have people that are worried they're going to lose their job because of Salesforce, because of the automation and reduced admin. So you could have different people, you know, for different reasons going through the grief cycle. And you've got to be aware of that, identify who they are and sort of work through how you move them through this grief cycle to the point of acceptance if you can do. And then the fourth um, example of an emotional state is mindset. And you can call people out again at the beginning of any Salesforce project and say, look, we're going to go through this journey with you. You can choose to be in a fixed mindset where, you know, this feels quite overwhelming. Like, you, you know, you feel scared of learning new technology. Um, you feel like you want to give up before you even start it. Or we can all go through this journey together in a growth mindset where you're going to learn the number one CRM project, that product, you're going to have new things on your CV, you're going to learn new skills, you're going to have a new way of working that is going to help you improve on your job performance. Like we can be in the growth mindset. And that is, I'd love us all to be in a growth mindset as we go through this journey. So you could use that to call people out straight away because all of us have a little gremlin on our shoulder in the back of our heads telling us we can't do this or we're scared and like little like negative little voice everybody has that so if you can help people get into a psychology where they call that out they've they recognized it they put it aside and go actually you're right this is a real great opportunity i'm going to get into the growth mindset then you're setting them up for success and helping reframe what they do so there are some examples where people might be on your salesforce projects now if you want to move them to a positive place, um, which is obviously where we, we kind of want to be, is there's different ways to motivate people. And the different ways will depend on the culture of the organization and what their preference is, but it will also depend on that mixture of people and the emotional journeys that they're going on. So some of the different ways that we talk about this is one, you could put in place a behavioral and reward strategy. And I've got little 
kids on this slide because it reminds me of how you perhaps manage your kids at home in different ways you know it's like giving them an ice cream you know do you give them acknowledge them in different ways for using salesforce using the dashboards you know using that as a way of giving an employee award because of the dashboard and what they've achieved on the dashboard um or if they get a certain number of trailheads do they you know get an award from the people that get the most points um, if they don't use Salesforce, how do you punish them? You know, is it that it's going to be part of their performance review? You know, there's lots of different ways you can sort of carrots and sticks approach with um, motivating people. So that's one option, which might, as I say, work for one culture of an organization, but doesn't work for all. The other approach is more cognitive, positive reframing. And this is where you're really creating that vision of how life can be different. Like you can do this. Like very much aligned with that growth mindset stage of like you know let's imagine you riding along at high speed let's imagine you performing and hitting those targets you want because you've got a new improved way of working it's creating very much visioning strategies aligning to their goals um, and using coaching techniques predominantly to kind of get people aligned and excited about where you want to be so that's where coaching really holds its own the third is around psychodynamic emotional engagements. And this is where those people who are really feeling the grief, um, you need to coach them, in, you know, maybe it might, they might need counseling, um, but you'll need to be much more empathetic. You'll need to be much more nurturing, more supportive, kind of really figuring out how to move them through the grief cycle. So that's how you need to think about those guys. And then you've got humanistic and growth and development. So these people are kind of excited that they love the fact that it's the number one CRM solution. They love the fact that they can get trailhead points. They love the fact they can add to their CV, potentially get a promotion. You know, they're the people that are really thriving on lifelong learning and adding things that are humanistic growth and development. And they just love the opportunity to progress. And so you will have people in every box potentially, and you'll have to choose what your motivational techniques are and have a combination in your toolkit. So they're kind of the different emotional. So that's the first set of sort of electric tools, if you like, but just understanding emotional intelligence generally and being aware of it and thinking about how you're going to tackle it um, is, is useful. The second, um, everybody's probably heard of SWOT analysis, but I think what really stood out for me in this exercise is the specific questions you ask in context to a Salesforce project. And this exercise can be really valuable where you have a mixture of people who are anxious, cautious, um, frustrated about the prospect of new Salesforce system. And you really need to empathize with them about what they love about how they work now. And that's where the first question comes into its own, because you say, what are the strengths of your current situation? You allow the, them the opportunity to talk about what they love right now. So you're empathizing with them. You're letting them get it on the table. It also allows you as a Salesforce professional to know what, what you need to mirror in the new system, because you need to replicate that success wherever possible. Um, so it allows just that voice and allows other people in the room who are excited about Salesforce to just acknowledge what other people kind of want and need. The next in W is what are the weaknesses of your current situation? And this is about then allowing people to say, OK, we get the strengths. What are the weaknesses? What are our pain points right now about how we currently work? And then we move to opportunities. And this is where we start to create the vision, if you like, of what the world could be like. So what are the opportunities presented by the new way of working, having Salesforce? What is it going to give us? And then we move on to threats. Like what is the threat of us staying in this current situation with the current systems without changing to Salesforce? So positioning SWOT in this way, I think, is really powerful for allowing everybody to have a voice. Um, regardless of what they're feeling, but also having a really balanced perspective on what they love about the way they work right now, but allowing them to see what the potential is if they move forward. And obviously you want to have a really good business case about the opportunities and the threats because you want everybody at this point to get on board with agreeing that actually moving forward is the best way. Like, and so you want to try and change the mindset of those that are in a a more antagonistic sort of situation to kind of going, okay, I, I put my strengths down, but I do understand why we need to move forward because of the opportunities and, you know, the threats that my, my position is. So that's the SWOT analysis um, model. 
So moving on to the next slide. Um, and I love this one too. I think these are also great for being able to work with clients. So logical levels is a really good tool to do risk analysis on your project and identify where the pain points are. Because I've been on a lot of projects, as I'm sure you have, where you've walked in where they've already had Salesforce and it's not working for a certain reason. Um, and so this can be a great exercise to sort of identify where those pain points are for that organization. Like, why is it not being adopted? Where is it sitting? It will be indefinitely in one of these six areas, which I'll go through in more detail in a moment. But also if you're starting a new project and you're kind of a brand new implementation, this is a great exercise to go, have we addressed each of these areas? Is there any problem pain points in each of these areas? Because inevitably that's where your risk is that the project might not be adopted. So it's a really good exercise. And my team love this um, tool and we now very much use it at a scoping stage um, on the project to kind of really help a client think through. Um, where it might be. So you can use this as a structure for discussing things with an organization, a department, and even an individual as well. So when we're looking at this from a Salesforce point of view, these are the types of questions and things I'd be considering. So the first is looking at the environment is, have you got the right IT infrastructure set up to support users to access the CRM? So that could be a broad range of things, but as examples, it could be, you know, have they got a good, have they got a good Wi-Fi connection? Because inevitably that is quite important with Salesforce and can be a stumbling block if it's slow to load. Um, the second is, you know, do they access things offline and do you need offline access set up? Do they need, um, do they quite often access things via the, the phone, the mobile? And have you done a, a user interface that is intuitive for the mobile, for example? So little things, but actually can make a massive difference. So it could be like, is Outlook set up, the integration set up properly? So again, it's intuitive and it's got the right quick actions and things inside it. All those little bits of a project and making sure that the IT infrastructure is set up and some of those non-functional things is really important. So that's like an example of the first. The second is around behavior. So a CRM needs to align to people's behaviors and how they work now. So where you see projects go wrong is where Salesforce has been implemented as an out of box solution and people are trying to squeeze their process and actions into it or changing the way they work to fit with the system, which is what you don't want. So inevitably you want to go into an organization and design a CRM to enhance their processes. So when we go in and work with clients, we will process map how they work right now. But as we go through that journey with them, we will tweak it by sort of saying, well, look, you do that now, that's quite manual. Do you want to automate that? Or do you want to you know, have, give them some scenarios? And we evolve their process and their current behavior to enhance it using technology to improve it. So it's about, you know, we see projects going wrong because things haven't mirrored people's behavior. There hasn't been sufficient business analysis um, versus where it can go right in that you're mirroring and enhancing their behavior. The third element of this NLP logical levels is capabilities. And there's two key things here. One is have, have the users been empowered with the knowledge of what Salesforce is, is possible of doing for them? Because they can only ask for things or be aware of things if they know what's possible. So part of our role during the design workshops and during the sales process is to educate people on what is possible using Salesforce. And that's when they get excited, hopefully, and they want everything and they can't afford it. But it's kind of making them aware of what the roadmap is, what they could do, um, and, and sort of always having that big picture vision. The second element of capabilities is knowing that they've got the training and skills to use the system. Have they be appropriately trained to use the system or administer the system um, in the way they need? So again, that's another sense check that we always do if we're looking at, a, you know, why a system hasn't been adopted. Um, and indeed, you'd want to check if you're going to implement a new system um, for somebody that they have all of this to their, their hand. The fourth is around values and beliefs. So we want to help an organization, team, individual realize benefits from the system. So the first thing that we want to do is understand what those benefits and values are for that organization, team analysis. And normally you do that through business analysis is, is sort of really get under the hood about, you know, 
how is this going to make a difference to you what is important to you and sort of really get a sense of that so when you're working through the design workshops going through the training with them you can say right i'm going to show you xyz now which is going to help you achieve those outcomes that you wanted it's going to help you align with the values that you've got about being innovative or whatever it is or being customer centric um, you know we're going to help you realize the values and benefits now where i've seen this go wrong is where we've walked into an organization where they've had Salesforce, but they were never clear on the values and benefits they wanted at the outset of what it was going to do to them. So they never had that measure of success. So I feel like this is an obvious one. Like, you know, we should always be clear on what customer success looks like because Salesforce very much champion that. Um, but that's sort of the, the, the fourth area to check. The next is identity. Like how does the organization identify with this CRM? Do they feel like it's over here as a system that they just have to input admin data? Or do they see the CRM at the heart of the organization that everybody logs into daily and uses um, to support their performance? So obviously you want the latter, like you want the CRM to be the center of their world. Where we see that projects fail is where it's seen as the extra bit of admin they need to do people aren't using the system day to day and it becomes a legacy distrusted system so that's like the, the fifth sense fifth sense check and i've even had clients rename the crm as storm and doris which are acronyms which i can't remember what they stand for but to be you know to actually give it its own identity so people don't feel negative about salesforce being the, the product so again it's interesting to think about well how do you identify this and i think this is where you know executive management and executive sponsorship have a real role because they want to make sure that they have communicated that the crm is now the main way everybody works and the alternative ways wouldn't now be used and that the value of this is going to be X, Y, Z. So senior management has to be really bought into this model. And this tool is a great exercise to do with the executive sponsors, because then you're saying to them, look, these are all the areas that could go wrong. Can we just check that we've got all of this covered? Um, and the final one with executive sponsorship is the purpose of this. And this is where you want them to think bigger than just the system. It's about if we do this, how will it help you um, achieve your purpose as an organization how will it help you maximize customer support maximize impact um, you know how can we help you to be innovative in digital transformation and to get to the point where they feel like a trailblazer customer like they're going to be on the next world tour stage talking about their story about how they've revolutionized the way they work you want to get them into that big picture mindset about how they are going to have an amazing project and journey and, and to be able to as i say achieve all ambitions i've ever had using salesforce you know that's kind of where you want to get and and i think have that vision for them being as say a trailblazer customer success story is is where we want people to be and that's where purpose sits so this model um you can use on yourself personally but you can use for your salesforce projects to help you identify where problems sit to help you assess and mitigate risk and help you to realize um you know a success plan for yourself really as you work through this so that's kind of the key coaching tools i'd love to know more from you in the chat you know which one resonated with you have you got experience of using coaching before um, i think we've got a few minutes to just talk about that if you like some of those coaching tools and you can see the value of them, then you can download um, my eight free coaching tools of some example of the tools that we use here. So there's a bitly code and a, a QRL. I'll put that in the chat after we've finished talking as well. So you can just click on it um, from that. And if, if any of you are interested in taking um, and learning more of the coaching skills and thinking about how they apply to Salesforce projects, I do run a coaching skills course. Um, which teaches you this coaching not only also for yourself but also for Salesforce projects which is £360 a year um, for a 12-month mem membership and you get access to these tools we talk through them we put people on hot seats as well so we give people time to talk about their own situations um, and opportunities and really explore those as well so I really love teaching all of this stuff um, and helping people be confident Salesforce professionals because um, you know it can really knock your confidence when you've got 
you know you don't know how to manage certain people on a project it's great if they're all excited and engaged it can be so much easier but you'll always have people in different camps and our role as sales professionals is not just the technical it's really those softer skills it's those influential skills communication skills that really makes a difference between a project being successful or not as well so if i can help any of you then i'd love to but hopefully just from tonight you've learned some extra tools to take away so thank you for having me um, tonight and I'd love to hear from you in the chat if there's your immediate takeaways. Um, you can also connect with me on LinkedIn as well because I'd love to stay connected with you all. So thank you for having me. Thank you so much. Oh my gosh, that was amazing. <laughs> thank you. Do, guys, do you have, if you have any questions, just uh, you can unmute yourself and ask them. Uh, there is one in chatter. Would you also have some advice tips for how to manage very excited, excited stakeholders who would like all their idea to be built right away and how to handle those expectations? Sure. So, well, I would use agile um, project management for that and Moscow prioritization um, to try and get everybody on the same page around what the priorities are. So that really lends itself to kind of, again, it's just having frameworks to kind of put people in a, in a way of working that helps people just think through things logically. I'm a very logical person, as you can see, and I think that's a good place to be with Salesforce. Like I have to have a structured way of communicating, thinking through things, allowing people to think through stuff. Um, and so when, you know, it always happens, right? You talk about, you sell them a solution, and they suddenly go from having 20 things on their wish list to 100 by the end of the design workshop. And you're thinking, oh shit, you know, how do I say no to these people? So, you know, working through Moscow, go prioritization and helping them um, work out what their must-haves are and that this organize this project or organization will falter if we don't you know do it to those that are should haves and workarounds is the way that we would normally um, have you know encourage facilitated conversations with people uh, as a group because everybody will have an input into that and there is another question. <clears throat> Any tips uh, how to get more executive sponsorship to have the CRM adopted? So with executive sponsorship, it's very much around building a business case um, for them. So you need to work out what they're, you know, you go through a business analysis framework. I just, I've got a podcast on this. If you sign up to my podcast called Mums on Cloud Nine, I actually talk through this next week on the podcast show um, and talk about the key principles of business analysis and what you would do is sort of creating a business case. But with you know, executive sponsors, they want to understand how Salesforce is going to help them achieve their business goals. Um, you know, they're, they're fixated on that. Where I've seen executive sponsorship not engaged is because they don't understand what Salesforce can do for them. So I always try, you know, quite often when we work with an organization, it's a fundraising team or one team want us. And so we go in and I very much, very much encourage wherever possible is to say, okay, you want Salesforce for fundraising, but can I ask that we have a bigger workshop with the other senior managers so they understand what Salesforce can do for the whole organization and they see val value in the platform holistically that they might roll out now but also in the future and that they can then start to understand you know and you give them the success stories and tell them the ROI that other organizations have got um, and again the different learning styles is really important here because on executive sponsorship you'll you'll need a combination of approaches that will hit Again, the visual kinesthetic learners, auditory um, visual and auditory digital ones, because there's different ways you need to communicate to get different people excited. So, you know, we very much sort of cover all that stuff in the coaching course, um, or you can Google it and, and sort of check it out yourself. And, and a bit of uh, scientific uh, support there uh, might help as well. Uh, so I think uh, uh, well, um, already five years, six years back, it was in um, uh, quite an extensive um, uh, research by MIT and uh, Capgemini Consulting, where they actually looked at uh, when digital transformation really are successful. Uh, one of the aspects, uh, well, the, the obviously, digital capability implementation is, is, is one angle, but the other angle was um, su quite surprisingly, the ability for leadership within an organization to align behind a, um, a vision, right? The North, North Star goal 
uh, but really executing uh, upon that within the organization. So enabling people to to actually make that change and, and being very vocal and, and supportive uh, within the organization. Um, and also making uh, some of the tough uh, choices along the way. So Leading Digital is the book if you are interesting, interested. And I'm also happy to talk about uh, it a bit further. But uh, I, I wanted to mention that because I think I've definitely your stuff, Heather, uh, along with that uh, backup, that will help you uh, gain leadership buy-in. Thank you so much. Any last questions? Anyone can unmute or <clears throat> write down in chatter. We'll also be sharing the presentation, so like that you can also have access and links that Heather provided. If not, thank you so much, Heather. That was really, really interesting presentation and I really enjoyed it.